Today, as you're watching this, the church is opening its physical doors again for the first time in about seven months, and I'm super excited for it. So I'm, I'm recording this beforehand on a Thursday, uh, since we're not really able to live stream just yet. But as I've been thinking about Sunday and, and thinking about opening the church again, uh, the idea that has come to mind is this thought that starting to open the doors of the church represents that the idea that there is an end in sight. This has been a massively long season for all of us, and we're all very aware that there is still a pandemic and still the chance of a second wave, and we know the world is still very much caught in it, but I just couldn't help thinking that by opening the doors of the church, there's some sense that there is an end in sight. And you know, that's not too far from a pretty good picture of the Christian life, in that as Christians, we know that there is an end, and that the end is coming. And we don't know when that is, though. But there is still this sense of expectation or should still be the sense of anticipation that an end is coming. So the Bible talks about this end as it uses the phrase the day of the Lord or the day of reckoning or the day of judgment, speaking about that day when Jesus will come back again to wrap everything up. And to sort everything out, which means to finally judge evil and sin and to restore creation and restore his people back to him again. Which is why the pictures in, this, in the Bible of this end is a, are pretty intense pictures. These are not the kinds of stories that you probably read to your kids at bedtime. So I reflected on that a little bit in Pentecost Sunday back in May 31st, the day of the Lord as described in the book of Joel. It's these intense pictures of how the end will happen when Jesus comes again to wrap everything up. So we know as Christians, we know there is an end, that it is coming. We're not sure when though, but there should be this sense of anticipation and expectation. Now that may be a very nervous anticipation or a very joyful anticipation. So our family got to go away on a holiday just last week for a couple days and man we have been telling Benjamin about this holiday to the beach for like for weeks. And so there was building this anticipation. He knows something is coming and it is a very joyful anticipation. And you know what that feeling is like. It's, you've got a holiday planned. It kind of can carry you through whatever difficulty you're going through, knowing that something good is about to happen. So there's this joyful anticipation. But there's another kind of anticipation, and that is a very nervous anticipation. And to stick with kind of a child analogy here, that might be like you know, when you're sent to your room because you've been misbehaving, and you know that punishment is coming. So I can't remember exactly those days, but you know what I mean. It's probably a pretty bad metaphor to equate a child being punished with the day of the Lord. But you know what I mean. There's this can be this dread or fearful anticipation because something is happening. Or there could be a very joyful anticipation that something good is happening. Now the kind of anticipation that you will experience when you hear the news that there is an end and the end is coming and this is what it looks like, whether it is a joyful anticipation or a very nervous anticipation, depends on where you are in relationship with Jesus. Because for the Christian, this idea that Jesus is coming to wrap everything up and finally deal with evil, for the Christian, there's absolutely Nothing to fear. Yes, we know He's coming to finally judge sin and evil. And yes, we know that we too are sinners and deserve judgment. But 
as Christians we know, Jesus himself paid that price, suffered the judgment for us, so that when he comes again, he knows we are his. And we don't have that. We just get to be swept up with him in this marvelous new creation. It's very much, for the Christian, the idea that the end is near is a marvelous, marvelous announcement. But for those who do not believe in Jesus, there's the announcement that the end is near and that Jesus is coming, God is coming again to wrap everything up and deal with evil leads to a different kind of anticipation. Now, as good as the anticipation is for the Christian of the end when Jesus will come again, as good as that anticipation is, it should not lull us into a sense of complacency. Instead, the announcement that the end is near and Jesus is coming, although we're not afraid, should motivate us to action. Do you realize a lot of the Bible's instructions about how we should live as Christians, a lot of the motivation that's used in the Bible is around this idea of, hey, Jesus is coming back, so get to work. I want to read one of those motivations or instructions to you today. The end is coming, and so this is how you should live. And the one that I'm going to read will just happen to have in it a couple of one another statements. So listen out for them. I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. And it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And as each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God himself supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong Glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, did you spot the one another statements? There's three of them. Love one another, show hospitality to one another, and serve one another. This is what you do in light of the fact that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, love show hospitality, and serve. Now, that's not all you do, mind you. The Bible has some more to say about what we do in light of the fact that the end is at hand. And in fact, in this passage is one other command. It's not a one another command, but it's still a, in light of the fact that the end is coming. And it is, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, before I get to the, the one another statement in this passage, which is obviously where we want to go in this series, can I just talk to you just real quick about that particular command in light of the fact that the end is at hand, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. See, so the Bible talks a lot about the end and about how intense that end, the day of the Lord will be. But the Bible also makes very clear that the run in to the end is kind of crazy with the world and creation itself kind of getting into a state of, of almost chaos. Which is why some Christians thought when coronavirus hit that, well, maybe this is a sign of the end because it's just creation kind of going into chaos and the world going into chaos. And I mean, who knows? Well, we don't know. But it's true that things kind of get a little bit more difficult as the end 
approaches. So it's going to be like that, and it's going to get worse as the day of the Lord approaches us. Now, what's really interesting is that in the end, when things are going crazy and the world's out of control and there's so much difficulty and panic and confusion, what's really interesting is that when the world is are running around losing their heads, Christians are called to keep their heads and pray. Be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Which is why when coronavirus first hit, one of the first things that we did as a church was to pray. Any of you remember those first few prayer meetings, we've been reminiscing a little as we enter this new chapter, reminiscing about our starting of online ministry. You remember those first prayer meetings? It was the Facebook live prayer meetings. Was I was the only one speaking and you were all commenting. Just We were doing that every single week. Because when this thing hit us and we were all confused and we didn't know what happening, see, for Christians, when things are kind of going crazy and we don't know what's happening, we keep our heads and we pray and I hope that if we as a church take anything out of this coronavirus season and there's a lot that we're going to take out of it but if there's anything that we take out of the season it's this this call to prayer because one day when this is all over when the coronavirus season is part past things are still going to be difficult and getting worse. The news is not just suddenly all going to turn to peaceful, happy stories. Political unrest, violence, corruption, further natural disasters, the economic downturn. Now what this statement means, Christians, when the end is near... And things are really difficult. You keep your minds. You pray. What that means is that whenever, now and later, I wonder if you do this, but when you read the news, so I read read the news on my phone. When you read the news or watch the news or listen to the news and you're reading all these really difficult stories, like what's your response? Is your first response like, (gasps) And like, man, and this kind of sinking feeling in your heart, if you read it online, do you kind of share it with others? Or is your response to kind of gather your thoughts and pray? It's not often that, is it? Or what about when when people send you these like WhatsApp forwarded messages of news, which is most often kind of fake news and fear-mongering, you know, those messages and you get those, and that feeling hits you like, oh my gosh, is this true? Like, what do you do? Do you just hit forward straight away, or do you stop and like, keep your head and pray? And when something comes up on your timeline, if that's how you're reading news, which is probably not the best idea, but if that's how you're getting news, come and it strikes fear in your heart, do you give in to that fear and lose your mind, or stop, be sober-minded, and pray. See, what I've found is that we, as people, but even Christians, are so quick to broadcast our fears instead of broadcasting our prayers. That's what this is saying. The end is at hand. I know things are going to be getting really difficult. So be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And now also, these three one another's in light of the fact that the end is near. So number one, love one another. That's not a surprise. We spoke about that last week. It is the foundational one another command 
It is the, describes the basic conduct of a Christian. So I don't want to say too much about it. I spoke about this last week, except to bring out an emphasis that's here this week. It wasn't there last week. So it's interesting that Peter says, love one another earnestly. We saw that phrase last week, but then he adds, for love covers a multitude of sins. Now, if you're a Christian who's been around for a while, a gospel-centered Christian, you should be asking, wait, whoa, hang on. Isn't it only Jesus that covers sins? I can't cover or atone for other people's sins. And yeah, absolutely. He's not talking about atoning or paying for other people's sins. Only Jesus could do that. And you might be reading that as a kind of discerning Christian and going, oh, hang on, and you listened carefully to Justin's sermon two weeks ago. Hang on, does that mean love covers over sins that I'm supposed to just sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen? So what does love covers over a multitude of sins mean? Well, we've got two clues here. First clue is that Peter is quoting from the Old Testament, Proverbs 10 verse 12, which says this, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers over a multitude of offenses. Hatred stirs up strife, love covers over offenses. So what he's talking about, what the proverb is talking about, what Peter is referring to, is that instead of holding on to offenses against you, instead of bringing them in the light in a way that would stir up strife and holding on to your bitterness, let it go out of love. Essentially, talking about forgiveness. In light of the fact that the end is near, let it go and move on, finally. Which is also easier said than done, right? Probably one of the hardest things to do is move on from grudges, move on from hurts, and forgive people. Which is why there's a, another clue here about what Peter means, is love one another earnestly. So the word earnestly, we, we've come up with before, and you might think it's just about an intense desire or commitment to love. And what's really interesting about this word is actually a picture, a word picture, and it's a picture of being stretchy or stretched. Love one another with a stretchy kind of love. If you're sitting there, man, I'm... I'm just, I cannot be patient anymore. No, no, stretch it some more. I can't forgive again. No, no, stretch it some more. Remembering that as a Christian, this ability to keep stretching, keep stretching our love comes from the very love of God Himself, which is infinite and keeps forgiving us, keeps covering over our sins. And so that stretch, you might think you cannot stretch it anymore. It's going to break. But because it's connected to the love of God, it has infinite tensile strength. It cannot break. You can continue to stretch out that love in light of the fact that the end is near. And maybe Peter's emphasis on, hey, the end is near, so stretch out your love, man. Maybe that's a little bit like the perspective that happens when somebody's nearing the end of their life, so they know that their end is near, perhaps they're really sick and kind of on, on their deathbed, so to speak, and you just know that that brings a certain kind of clarity of perspective. You just all of a sudden realize what's truly important, and that is people, and you might be thinking, you, know, you would be in the situation going, I, just, I wish I could reconcile, and all I want is those people back around me again. And I think that's, you know, not an easy thing for us to think about, but it's, it's worth pursuing a little bit because that's this idea. There is an end and it really should affect how we live now and especially how we treat others. So I'm sure you've heard of the, this rule that the rule of will it matter in five years rule. You heard that? I remember first coming across that kind of a really difficult work situation, struggling with a kind of conflict, difficult area. And, and somebody's saying to me, man, just, just think about it. In five years' time, like, will this still matter? And it was just, I remember being so helpful at the time, going, you know what, no. Now, sometimes, the will this matter in five years, you go, well, yes, 
like good. I mean, it brings clarity on whether this is something really worth pursuing. But most of the time, perspective, like why am I holding so tightly onto this? It's not, it's not worth it. And maybe that's a little bit like the reverse of this idea that I'm at the end. So now looking forward to the fact that there's this end. How should that change? What perspective should that give me? And maybe that's what Peter's saying. Hey, the end is near. I mean, really, is this something that you should be holding on to? Or is it time to love and let it cover over some of these offenses and hurts that you've been through? So, the end of all things that is a hand, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Second one another in this passage, a lot of the fact that the end is at hand, show hospitality to one another. I when I first read that, I thought, you know, on the scale of like loving people, and like serving people, which we'll get to in a moment. Hospitality seems a little bit down here. I mean, for me, the idea of somebody being hospitable, it's like a virtue. Some people are just really good at it. Give it in that way. It's really nice that you have it, but it's not an essential characteristic. And yet, this idea of hospitality comes up a lot in Scripture. For example, like Hebrews 13 verse 2, which I've often thought about, it says, Let brotherly love continue. That was last week. Let brotherly love continue. Do not, therefore, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Just something really interesting to think about. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And this connection in Hebrews to brotherly love is interesting because, you know, we spoke about this a little bit last week, but in our more modern cultures, and not all modern cultures, but especially modern Western cultures, where we live very individualistic lives, and it's quite, you know, strange to think about this open command to welcome strangers into your homes. What the connection to brotherly love means is that for the Christian Every other Christian, remember, is family and therefore hospitality is an essential feature, not an option, because, because we're family. Which is why, by the way, I thought I'd just mention this today, since the nominations for elders close today, why showing hospitality is a requirement for elders. That's 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. Not just a virtue, not just something nice, an essential feature of being a Christian. Which again, is easier said than done. Which is why I just, I love this. That Peter just goes on to kind of qualify that, show hospitality without grumbling. So love how like, honest the Bible is, because... God just knows when it comes to this. You may not feel like it, but do it anyway. It may not suit you to be hospitable right now, but do it anyway. Which, by the way, I feel like sums up a lot of our instructions as Christians in the Bible. Don't wait until the right time or the right feeling to do the right thing, do it anyway. That's what without grumbling indicates. That it's going to be inconvenient. You're not going to feel like it right now, but do it anyway. I think it applies to so much of the Christian life, especially what is spoken about today. Pray anyway. You may not feel like it. It may not be the right. Pray anyway. Love anyway. You're not going to feel like stretching out your love again. But love anyway and be hospitable anyway. Lastly, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this. Third one another statement that comes up. The end of all things is at hand. So be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. Love 
be hospitable and serve, serve one another. So, as I just said, there's some things that don't come naturally as a Christian, but you do it anyway. But now we get to the part that says there are some things that do come very naturally. And in fact, God has wired you that these things would come naturally. And he intends to put his Holy Spirit power behind these things to empower you to serve his kingdom. Verse 10 to 11 of 1 Peter 4 is just one of the best and shortest summaries of the idea or the theme of spiritual gifts. So if you're new to Christianity or checking this out, you're wondering what is this gift? What are spiritual gifts? Here's a great definition by Wayne Grudem. He says this, a spiritual gift is any talent or ability any talent or ability which is empowered by the Holy Spirit and able to be used in the ministry of the church. Any talent or ability which is empowered by the Holy Spirit and able to be used in the ministry of the church. Which is this amazing idea that God has wired some things into us naturally, but then intentionally, but then supernaturally empowers it to be used for His glory in His church. So I thought it worth like walking through this slowly, almost word by word through verse 10, to unpack a little bit what this idea of serve one another with spiritual gifts means. So it starts out and says, as each has received the gift. Each person, meaning everyone has this. Everyone, as each has received a gift. Now that's important. All of the words are so important. As each person, yes, you sitting there, as each person has received, not earned. And I emphasize that because the word for gift here in spiritual gifts is the same word as for grace. Grace Gift to send. This is not something you earn. And I emphasize this because sometimes Christians think this, that they can be only used of God in a powerful way once they have really dealt with all the problems in their life, once they've come to learn the Bible. It's kind of this idea of like moving up, like almost think about a, a, a game. I'm not really big into gaming, but the, the video promoting today's services were just so fun, like gaming. It's almost this idea that Christians have of the Christian life and spiritual gifts as gaming. So as you get better, you kind of collect points and then you get enough and you like level up and you get these supernatural abilities, but you have to earn them. No, no, no. As each has received a grace gift. In fact, you had received this gift, this wiring before you became a Christian, before you became a Christian. Before you were born, you received this in anticipation of when you would become a Christian and when then the Holy Spirit would take residence in your life and open this up to be used for God's glory. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. I want to focus on the word serve, the word serve one another, not serve yourself. Well, it sounds obvious, but just, you know, think about it. Sometimes if you've been around Christianity for a while now, speaking to you, kind of have this idea of spiritual gifts and supernatural abilities, and we see some of them in action. And, and sometimes there's this sense of wanting them or wanting to use them to make yourself look good. Where is the gifts expressly given to make Jesus look good? Verse 11, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. We orient our lives around that. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. 
And so again, in light of the fact that the end is near, just think about it. I mean, Jesus is going to arrive in such glory and in such power. It's going to seem silly and ridiculous for anyone to feel self-important at that moment. Be swallowed up in the coming of Jesus Christ. So use what you have, not for you, but to glorify Him by serving others. Use it to serve one another. And the last part I'm going to focus on here, as good stewards of God's varied grace. As good stewards. Now that word, that's an important word, stewards. See, a steward is not an owner. The word is literally like a manager, like a house manager. So you've got the owner of the house and he's entrusted someone with the management of his household. The manager doesn't own the house. The manager just runs it. He's responsible for it. He's been given that responsibility. A steward is not an owner. So when Peter talks about these spiritual gifts and says, use it to serve one another as stewards, no, no, this is not yours. It's been given into your possession. But it doesn't belong to you. It's God has donated that. It's His. And He's wired it in you. To really glorify Him. These gifts, don't, that's why you can't use them to serve yourself. We are, in most of the Christian life, <laughs> in our whole lives, what do we really own? I mean, as Christians, we don't even own our lives. We don't own grace. Everything has been in trusted has been given to us as a gift we are not owners of anything of our time of our possessions of our gifts and abilities we are stewards operators given this immense responsibility been entrusted with this immense responsibility but it doesn't belong to us it belongs to him who's coming again and will ask for a reckoning of how we have used these things that have been entrusted to us. Which have been entrusted to us, verse 11, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So, in summary, this idea of the end of all things is at hand. You might be thinking, man, Peter wrote that like a couple hundred years ago. And he meant it's at hand, it hasn't happened yet. Is it, is it really at hand? But what that saying, when the Bible talks about that the end is near, is that all of the major events in God's plan of redemption have happened. The last event that needed to happen to accomplish God's plan of salvation was the death and then resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. We are living in the final act. There's nothing more that needs to happen in order for Jesus to come again, for the day of the Lord to happen, for this to be wrapped up and sin to be dealt with. That's why it's at hand. It could happen at any moment. And that really should change the way that we live. So the Bible reminds us of it so often. Every moment of our lives should be radiated with the light of the knowledge of the coming again of the glorious one, Jesus Christ. And in light of that, we pray, love, show hospitality, and serve Him and His kingdom. Let's pray. God, as we enter into this, into this moment of reflection, this thought, this, uh, this idea in Scripture that you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again, that there is an end and that it is approaching. So no, for so many of us, and myself included at times, just seems like such a distant reality, if a reality at all, but so distant. And I pray, God, that today, strangely, on this day when... 
we're so excited about so many things and it seems like there is an end but a good end God just help us to see that for that to anchor us as I believe you intend it to anchor us as you've revealed in your word that our lives are radiated by this knowledge the fact that you the glorious one are coming again There's a finiteness to our lives. There's a finiteness to the universe. Limited time. God, may that bring the right perspective for us, please, we pray. Perspective that enables us to love others, to stretch out that love and let things go, to forgive and not hold on to the hatred and bitterness right up to the end. And this perspective that enables us to show hospitality and that enables us to serve freely to keep our minds knowing that what the world needs most when things are going crazy is for Christians to keep their heads pray and serve and love and welcome others into our family God help us to do that as individuals and as a church. May Rosebank be this, this kind of family unit. And when, when Joburg is scared and when Joburg is anxious and when Joburg is out of control, that we here are self-controlled and sober-minded, trusting in you, praying for your kingdom to come and loving, accepting and serving people who need you help us be that jesus i pray we pray in your name amen